are a crucial element for the delivery of social protection systems and we need to know how we connect to those. And for, for the dialogue, for this participatory approach of developing um, standards, the Convergence Initiative uses a number of formats and examples include um, our dialogue series talking interoperability, where we have governments um, showcase the interoperability and the way um, of achieving this um, uh, in their respective social protection systems. And you will find a number of recordings of recent events on the website of the uh, com uh, Digital Convergence Initiatives, which soon will you know, be revamped and have a new appearance, but uh, you still find the recordings and it's really worth uh, watching. Very interesting examples. And today's format is um, a slightly different one. It's uh, the format interoperability in action, you know, where we focus on discussing the interface between certain subsystems. Maybe uh, can you um, switch to the next slide, please? Um, where we uh, focus on discussing the interface between uh, certain subsystems for, for social protection. And we recently ran the first event focusing on, on the IVS systems, and today's event is focused on the interface with a payment platform. There are a number of uh, work streams uh, which are basically scope of what we in the convergence initiative currently call the first phase, which is the interface between the social protection MIS and the foundational ID systems, so civil registration and payment platforms, and there are more work streams being taken up. These work streams are open and we encourage everybody um, to to uh, connect to us and to contribute to these work streams. At the end, you know, the uh, definition of the interface is what we think is a standard uh, or an offer for a standard, which can be taken up and guide, you know, the uh, the connector also for the different um, software providers. Um, with the focus on the payment system, we obviously covered today a uh, extremely crucial. Um, uh, interface. Uh, there is, uh, we've seen the importance also of, of a seamless transition um, in shock, in recent shocks like the pandemic, where we, um, you know, had to deliver and scale up uh, very quickly. Um, and that, you know, can only be done if we have a seamless flow of information. Um, and so it's um, really, really a crucial interface. And I'm very glad that today, again, we are joined by many colleagues representing a huge amount of uh, experience and expertise in this topic. And I'm, I'm grateful uh, to, to all um, uh, joining, but also uh, to those particularly who are you know, willing to share you know, their specific focus um, today and their specific experience. And with that, um, I hand over to my colleague Anita Mittal to um, maneuver us through the event today. And I wish us all a very fruitful exchange. Over to you, Anita. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Ralph. Hope you can hear me clear. Yes, we can. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the introduction and setting the context for today's workshop, which is the second in the series. And what does the agenda look like for today, right? So we had the welcome and context setting by Ralph. In the next 40 minutes, you will hear about why digital payments or interoperability with payment systems is important for social protection program delivery. And then we will also show you how this can be achieved through standards along with a demo with the Mojalu payment system, how things can be done. And that is the interoperability in action part, which will be shown to you. After that, we have brief interventions from various international organization, countries, and solution providers. As we say that there is no leader without followers. There is There are no standards without people adopting it. So in that vein, we want to involve different stakeholders from uh, donors, international organization, countries to provide their inputs and guidance and become part of the community which is developing these standards. So. In that light, you will hear from G2PX, DGAP, and BMGF from the global perspective. Country, we are hearing from India. Zambia had to drop out last minute. 
due to issues, but we have a very good recording of the Zambia payment systems done as part of our dialogue series. Then from for payment solutions, we will hear from India and from the Mojaloop Foundation and private sector. We have switched TPH, which is implementing payment systems for social protection in Tanzania, as well as from Microsafe Consulting, which has done payments work in quite a few countries. And then you will have an opportunity to ask questions to all the speakers and the <coughs> DCI come presenters. And the wrap up will be done by Veronica. So why interoperability with payment systems is important to social protection? We all are familiar with this delivery chain diagram of the World Bank, right? Where we say, <coughs> what are the common processes? for excuse me, social protection. So here you see that we start with registration, assessment of needs, conditions, eligibility, and different systems are involved in this delivery chain, right from social registry to ID system to social protects MIS systems. Once beneficiaries are enrolled, then you start delivery of benefits, which could be payments or in kind and services. And this is the place where interoperability with the payment switches comes in play. And if you want digital delivery of programs to be efficient, effective, the interoperability with payment systems is indispensable for social protection program delivery. So now let us see the scenario where you don't have any digital system. So how does the delivery of this benefit for the old age element scheme look like? So we have John Doe, who is the same character who continues from a previous workshop. He wants to apply for old age element scheme. This is all paper documents submitted, verified manually through these systems, taking quite a few days to validate. Once this is done, then all the eligible beneficiaries, how do they get payments without digital payments? You must all have heard of the places where you know you have big vans carrying loads of money or bikes or cycles where money is carried, going to the di different regions and handing over money to the people and the different kinds of leakages which happens in this delivery chain. And the money may not even go to John Doe. It may end up with somebody else. So I don't want to spend too much time. There's a lot of literature and case studies that we have heard. And John Doe will have to again go back, go to the SP officer uh, who is dispersing the money. And reconciliation, I'm never, not sure how successful it will be with all these kind of manual workflows. Now look at the scenario two, where we have improved quite a bit with digital systems. You have a digital MIS system talking to various ID systems, CRVA system to validate the identity of and the eligibility condition of John Doe. But when it comes to count verification, the system is not end-to-end -end interoperable. The digital systems exist, but they are not integrated and interoperable. So what happens, and this is not a hypothetical scenario. Just recently, I've spoken to two countries who are doing their payments. They call it digital payments, but the document that goes out of SPMIS is an Excel file, which goes to the Treasury or to the Finance Department, which probably takes a printout, validates the accounts, does lots of to and fro validation. Then again, this Excel file is sent to a couple of other departments. So in the case of Zambia, we had heard there are almost about 70 to 21 processes happening before this Excel file hits the beneficiary bank, uh, sorry, the SP bank, which is the social protection program bank account. 
where they get the list of beneficiaries to whom this money needs to be paid. And again, how this money is distributed to the various beneficiary banks is again, you know, very varied in various countries. You'd be hearing some of these things in from the other global perspectives, but this varies quite a bit. Uh, whether there's a payment switch or not, or there's a payment gateway, or you have direct interaction with the beneficiary account. We are trying to show you a very simplistic workflow, but in reality, it is quite complicated. And that's why interoperability with payment systems is not a very simple thing, though it may appear with these workflows. And the reconciliation again goes through various digital emails and paper-based manual channels back to the system. And this whole process definitely takes weeks and probably by that time or months, there is time for the next disbursement to happen. Now look at the scenario where we have all digital systems integrated and interoperable. And now we are looking at the old age 11 scheme where the identity has been validated the age and uh, status has been validated with the CRVS system. And once the beneficiary is enrolled through the interoperability layer, the payment layer, interoperability layer, the account has been validated. The payment file goes electronically after approvals to the beneficiary, sorry, to the social protection payer bank account and the payment switch distributes the money to the various beneficiary bank accounts and probably John Doe gets an SMS notification on his mobile and can use a mobile app to access the money that has been deposited, which brings a lot of joy and happiness on his face. Just look at his, the emoji that has changed from a sad face to a happy face. If you look at another use case for child education scheme, one thing which you will notice is that while the eligibility and identification happens, when it comes to the payment layer, the same process flow. Verification and account, sending the payment file, making the payments to the various beneficiary bank accounts. So with this, we see that there is similarity in the payment layer operations for different social protection programs. So if we could standardize these services, which a payment layer or payment system provides to SP programs, you will see that if the hard work is done for one or two programs, the new programs come and leverage this digital public infrastructure or the shared system of payment system rails seamlessly and from day one, digital payments becomes part of that program. So now we will see how can this payment interoperability layer or interoperability be established with the different payment architectures which may exist in countries, some very basic, some very advanced. So for this, I'm going to invite a team from Access Health and Modus Box who have been supporting us for developing these use cases, process flows, and the interoperability in action with the Mojo Loop system. Today, we will, Michael, Vijay, and Komal will be presenting, and in the lower half, you see other members of our team. With this, I invite Michael to take over the floor. Thanks very much, Anita. I will just share my screen. OK, are you seeing that? Yes. Excellent. OK, so thank you very much, Anita, for your excellent introduction. Uh, I'm going to be talking a little bit about API standardization and uh, our payments interoperability layer, how it would look 
and the sorts of things that it might do. So I'm going to start by talking about API standardization and by asking what might seem to be a simple question. What is an API? For me, it's a kind of language that systems use to communicate with other systems. I like other language. It's a way of saying what you want to happen. You can use it to say what you want to do without needing to know how to do it. And the analogy that I use, though I know not everybody agrees with it, is to say, well, think of a baby. Baby doesn't have very many complicated things that it can say, but the interface works because the parents take the simple communication of the baby and translate that into the more complicated provision of uh, bottles, nappies, baths, sleep, all of the other things that a baby knows how to do. And that's the kind of thing that we see happening via an API. The API should be as simple as it can be for the system that's using it, in this case, the social protection system. And the complexity that it hides is something which it shouldn't need to know about any more than it needs to. So our motto in this part of the demonstration is going to be a successful API allows the social protection system to be the baby. Now, I want to look in a bit more detail about what I think a generic payments interoperability layer would look like. Uh, there's going to be some technical stuff here, so buckle up, might be a bumpy ride. OK, so we're going to start with a series of social protection programs, education, agriculture, health. We're also going to start with a finance ministry because any jurisdiction has lots of different social protection programs. But the process of making a payment is typically the same for each of them. They don't pay in a very different way because they're education or because they're agriculture or because they are health. So what we're going to provide is a single way for them to request a payment, a single API. That API will include standard security on access and use so that, again, each social protection program doesn't need to provide its own standard security. It can just make use of the best practice, which is encapsulated in the API interface. Also, we would expect this to be run by a government department like perhaps the finance ministry, which has close relations with the account holding institutions, which understands how they work and which finds it easy to interact with them to make sure that they provide the best possible service to the social protection programs. Now that API will provide a standard set of resources. Uh, I've got some examples across things there, uh, but the point about them is they are standardized so that the social protection programs don't have to develop their own APIs, their own resources, and also so that they can benefit from evolving best practices. As new ways of paying come into play, as new facilities are available, they can be provided once via the API and individual social protection programs don't have to go through the often complicated and difficult uh, way of providing them themselves. They can provide it once and centrally. Uh, and our motto here is that government payment interoperability is a journey, not a destination. Okay. Underneath that then is the payment services, which are defined by the API. So our example here is executing payments. When you call it, uh, when a social protection program calls that API resource, then it's passed first of all to an execution module, which essentially manages the administrative functions. These are things like recovering beneficiary lists to execute, breaking down and reassembling beneficiary lists, and saving result sets for reporting and reconciliation. And you can see that those are stored in a persistent data store, which belongs to the payment interoperability layer, so that things like reconciliation reports can be directly requested by the social protection programs uh, which need them. Below that, we have what we call a payment multiplexer. Now, 
we might easily have to contact more than one payment execution system, for instance, if there's no central switch in the jurisdiction, or if there is a central switch, but it's accessed via separate uh, account holding institutions. Now the payment manager, sorry, the payment multiplexer manages breaking down and reassembling beneficiary lists so that they can be rerouted to the correct payment execution system. And we don't wind up in a situation where we just send the list to every payment execution system so that uh, they get a uh, notification of requests that they can't possibly fulfill. I won't name names, but I have heard of a, uh, a how can I put this, an instant payment system in an advanced country where that was the case. We then pass it down, the payment request that is, which is now specific to a particular payment execution system. It's passed down to payment adapter. And the adapter is responsible for converting the generic payment execution requests, which is how things have appeared all the way down the system to this point, into the language of a particular payment execution system and for requesting execution of the payments in that system. So if you have, let's say, one system for banks and another network for mobile money wallets, the payment adapter for mobile money, wa money wallets will convert a generic request into language that the payment wallets will understand. And finally, we have the payment execution system itself. This is where the payment is actually executed. The results are returned by this system in a system specific form and we convert them back into a standard form further up our stack and then they go back to the uh, social protection program which originally requested them in a standard form no matter what kind of payment execution system actually executed the payments so that's how roughly we structure a payments interoperability layer let me now say things can get quite complicated. Now, you don't have to look at this in detail, but really what it's intended to say is that we can imagine a situation where we might have two or three different directory services in a jurisdiction, several payment execution system adapters, and several account information services. The account information services are recording inbound payments that are made by people, for instance, who are subscribing to health plans, uh, who are paying school fees, those sorts of things. Uh, and they are also uh, produced into the payments interoperability there and sent back to the requesting institutions. Now, this can get complicated, but my point is, let's imagine that Uh, a switch to manage payment execution. Now, everything uses the same payment execution adapter. So things become simpler in the payments interoperability layer, but nothing changes in the social protection program. That continues just to make requests to say, pay these people this amount, pay these people this amount. It doesn't need to know whether more payment execution systems have been added, whether payment execution systems have been taken away. How those things are actually distributed across the physical systems is entirely the responsibility of the payments interoperability layer. So I show you a complicated diagram. Uh, my main point in showing it is to say, the way this works is to conceal all of that complication from the calling programs. So adapters then provide a form of insulation between layers. Let's imagine that we want to pay a beneficiary money system and the money will come from a payment bank. There needs to be an API that connects those two systems and it can't function without some form of communication between those two systems. Let's now imagine we have social protection programs and a payments interoperability layer. And each of those will have an API layer between them. But the function of the API layer is basically to insulate each program from anything other than its immediate neighbor. So the social protection program only needs to know how to communicate with the payments interoperability layer. The payments interoperability layer, in this case, only needs how to communicate with, only needs to know how to communicate with the payments bank. 
and the payments bank only needs to communicate with the beneficiary mobile money system. So each of the components is insulated from all of the others by the use of a standard API, which performs the same functions using the language of the target system. So now I'm just going to look at the two scenarios that we are going to be showing today. Uh, first of all, one in which the social protection program calls an FSP financial service providers API. So we have a demo, demo UI and the social protection program that's going to send a request to the payments interoperability layer. The payments interoperability layer has in it a payment multiplexer service, and that is going to be sending to the Mojaloop scheme, where there's a Mojaloop payment manager and a testing toolkit, which will enable you to see what's going on in that scheme. That Mojaloop scheme has a social protection bank, a sending bank, <coughs> pardon me, a payment switch to route the messages, and a beneficiary bank. So that will show how things go through to Mr. John Doe and his account is updated and he gets a message saying, <coughs> pardon me, I have uh, received, you, sorry, you have received some payment. So that's the first scenario. Uh, we'll have a receiver mobile application simulator to, just to show uh, Mr. John Doe getting his message. Second, we're going to look at calling a payment switch via a third party API. Now, that happens in the same way as before in the first instance. The social protection program sends a payment to the interoperability layer. But now the interoperability layer communicates directly with the payment switch via a third party API. And now the payment switch sends to the social protection bank saying, please make this payment. The social protection bank routes the payment through the payment switch to the beneficiary bank and it gets to Mr. John Doe. Now what's the difference here? The difference is that the payments interoperability layer only needs to know how to communicate with the third party API. If there were four or six or eight or ten different institutions at which social protection programs held their accounts, then the first so the first of these scenarios that I just talked about will mean that the payments interoperability there needs to know how to communicate with each of those account holding institutions. The use of a third party API, it only knows how to communicate with the third party API and the payment switch manages the communication with the individual account holding institutions. Now, when I said uh, you shift work in this system. There's less work being done in the payment interoperability layer, but there needs to be some more work done uh, in the social protection banks because now they need to be able to manage interactions with the third party API. On the other hand, there are opportunities there as well. So it may very well be that it's still worth their while to do that extra work. And that is all that I have to say. Uh, I will pass over now to my uh, my colleague, uh, Vijay Kumar, whose excellent technical work has really been the foundation of all of our ability to demonstrate things today. Thanks, Michael. Let me share my screen. Can you hear me and see my screen? Yes. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to demonstrate the proof of concept for government to person payments through the module loop uh, switch. So I'm going to use the same use case, Mr. John Doe getting pension payments from the government. I don't want to repeat the flow again. So I will just uh, show you the components I used for the demo. So we have a demo ui uh, for social protection scheme management system and we develop a payment multiplexer service uh, which takes care of the transformation from social protection management system to the uh, sender bank i mean the communication between this 
and let's say this payment switch is a moja loop switch and these two are the sender bank and beneficiary bank are participants of the moja loop scheme so i'm going to simulate uh, this stack using the moja loop tools like moja loop payment manager and testing toolkit so these are the moja loop tools um, which simulate uh, the moja loop switch and also the participants i mean banks so uh, in the testing toolkit um, we have a web interface we can see the all the moja loop requests flowing through the switch and um, we got also uh, some mobile application simulators um, in those simulators we can see the inbound payment to john doe so let me show you the demo here on the left hand side this is the social protection scheme management system and on the right hand side these are the two mobile application simulators of green bank and pink bank so uh, let's say john doe holds an account with pink bank he logged into his mobile application so, uh, he can see the inbound payments and updated balance here on the left hand side this is the moja loop testing toolkit interface this is the monitoring page in this page we can see all inbound and outbound requests flowing through the moja loop switch so i'm going to execute the payment using social protection management system here and we should get notifications on the right hand side and i will show you the module uh, module loop requests in this interface testing toolkit interface so let's enter the national id of john doe here and search so the social protection scheme uh, gets this information from crvs system civil registry let's continue and here we need to validate the bank account details of this national id so let's click on this you can see the tick mark here so the bank account details are validated how this happened so the uh, interoperability layer payment interoperability layer sends a discovery request to the payment execution system which is moja loop so you can see the discovery calls here get parties which is moja loop discovery call so let me clear the screen and uh, may register this national id you can see registration is successful after that um so there are three payments populated here you can see john doe should get 5500 when i click on this initiate payment the social protection scheme triggers the disbursement and uh, we should get notifications here through the moja loop switch so let me click on this you can see the inbound notifications of 5500 indian rupees and here it is saying payment completed and you can see also the updated balance this is the reconciliation you can see the completed statuses of three items three beneficiaries so john john do got his pension let's see the requests in moja loop world so these are the requests moja loop re related requests you, you can see discovery calls and some quoting calls and finally the transfer payment execution we can also see the http payload if we want yeah so this is about the government to person payment thanks everyone uh, handing yes. back to Anita. Thanks, Vijay. Can you just hold on? I see a hand up from Punit. Uh, Punit, anything urgent you want to quickly raise on this I, screen? Yeah, just a quick one. I just want to understand the calls that you made from the social protection system were to the Moja Loop, right? Were the Moja, Moja Loop APIs or there was the, the calls were made to the SP Bank? 
um, there's a confusion on the scenario one and scenario two and, and what you have been demonstrating, which one was that? Okay, so we developed a payment multiplexer service here, right? The social protection management system calls the simplified API. So we uh, developed a standard API on this. So the payment interoperability layer calls the API of SP Bank. I see, okay. So um, uh, I am uh, I am showing the module loop transactions inside the payment switch. Okay, so the is the SP Bank API as that were called. Okay. Yeah, SP so Bank. Uh, we so have those are some not necessarily sample. standardized, right? Those are not necessarily standardized. And those are the SP Bank's API. Yeah, the, this is the SP Bank API that can be particular to the oh. uh, uh, financial institution. Got it. All right. So the this payment interoperability layer should have adapters to communicate with dip, uh, various uh, banks. Got it. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Vijay. Thanks for that uh, clarification Thanks. and Puneet for the question. And Puneet, just for your information, in this demo we have shown the scenario where we are calling the SP Bank, but there was another event where we had shown the third party interface, which was at the OpenMS payment layer workshop which we had done. So I can share the recording if you're interested in looking at the third party interface demo of the Mozilla Loop system. Yes, Anita, that'll be great. Sorry, yeah. I missed those sessions. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Now I'm inviting Komal to walk us through the standards part. Komal, over to you. Thanks, Anita. Uh, for the interoperability to happen, this uh, standards, we all know the standards plays a major role. So we, as a part of our interoperability DCI initiative, are also working on defining the, the open standards, uh, code directories, and the associated value set that, that, needs, that can be used for uh, designing these APIs, which, uh, which would be hosted. So Anita, if you can share the next slide. So here uh, on this slides, I'm sharing the quick snapshot of two scenarios, which is the payment request and the payment reconciliation, which Vijay and Michael has talked about. So this shows about how the for every transactions to happen from SP bank account to the beneficiary, there was a multiple beneficiary. So we are defining uh, the open standards where which is related to the disbursement identifier and an array of pay, uh, pay list, which is the beneficiary list. Next step, Anita. Which actually has a multiple uh, patch file to transfer the amount from defining the transfer the amount and the currency from SP bank account to the pay bank account. So similarly, the second slide, talks about uh, the payment response. So once the payment has been made to the beneficiary account, a reconciliation defining the disbursement ID and the pay results as to what account has been transferred the amount or has not been transferred the amount, that needs to be uh, to go back to the SP for, for their own records and reconciliation. And here we are trying to define and show the different uh, uh, parameters, the different data elements that that are uh, that we are listed in that uh, Excel, uh, the payload reconciliation, which is like the payment type, value, amount, the currency in which the amount has been transferred, the times and the the time the transaction has been made, the status of the success. So, like Vijay has shown the scenario with the two uh, mobile phones, right? So, but if the payload is like about 400, there will be different transaction value where the account was traceable, was reachable, or the amount was transferred or not transferred. So those transactions we are defining. Along with this, we are also defining the code directories and the associated value sets for different, uh, to define the standard structure throughout the processes. So this is a snapshot that we, we have we are designing and developing as part of the initiative. Next slide, Anita. Anita, next slide. 
yeah this is like our code directories and the apis uh, also will be publishing in our open source which can be referred in, uh, by anyone to see how the demonstration can be done so this demo apis will be available and we invite feedback comments to further improve upon it thanks that's all from my side yeah thanks uh, so much komal for walking us through a it was basically a teaser into what standards we are trying to develop, right? Because some, we have received some questions earlier. What are the data standards? What are the APIs you're looking at? And we'll be announcing formation of working groups where you can contribute in various ways. With that, now I'll start the sort of lightning presentations where we hear about global perspective, country, and solution providers. So for the first one, I'm inviting uh, the Georgina from the G2PX initiative of the World Bank. Over to you, Georgina. Thank you very much, Anita. Um, and uh, if we can go to the next, perfect. So uh, first of all, I don't know if everyone's familiar with what the G2PX initiative is, but G2PX is a World Bank initiative that brings together the different parts of the World Bank group that are working on advancing digitization of G2P payments. But changing the paradigm of thinking about it through a lens of digital G2P payments, not only for efficiency gains, but also to achieve long-term long development outcomes that we can see here in the slide. And there's evidence that these outcomes can be achieved when G2P payments are digitized uh, in, a, in a certain way. So if we move to the next slide, we can see that during COVID, um, it, it was a great example of how leveraging digital public infrastructure to deliver social protection programs can contribute to making the systems more responsive um, and also more efficient. So in this study that we put out uh, about months ago, uh, you can see that the countries that were able to leverage uh, uh, data sharing platforms as well as digitized records and IDs were able to reach more beneficiaries uh, than those that couldn't leverage this kind of systems uh, to identify and to uh, assess eligibility of beneficiaries. In addition to this, those countries that could use digital payments, colleagues from space have shown that they were able to reach beneficiaries more quickly. And we also see that in this countries, um, they were able to advance financial access um, which can be a, a, a pathway to financial inclusion. If we move to the next slide, please. So uh, the different parts of the World Bank uh, came together through GTPX to create a framework on what a modern GTP architecture could look like and to try to define what are some of the design principles and characteristics um, across the architecture to that can support the delivery of digital G2P payments. And here we have some of these design principles that we think are critical to be able to achieve the long-term development outcomes such as financial inclusion and women's empowerment through the digitization of payments. So first of all is making sure that multiple programs and different G2P payment streams can leverage the same systems as, as we saw in the first uh, presentations today. So this shared infrastructure will make um, will be critical in gaining efficiency um, throughout the, the, the process. Then making sure that there is choice given to beneficiaries on which provider to use. And when introducing choice, it becomes even more important how we are creating the interface between social assistance programs and payment systems, since we don't want to um, create multiple connections instead having just one interface as the last scenario that Anita presented would be the ideal work feasible. Um, something that is really important when it comes to the policy side of things is ensuring that payments are going into fully functional transaction accounts and not limited purpose accounts that might uh, only allow beneficiaries to cash out or might even force beneficiaries to cash out immediately, uh, like in the cases where there's clawback clauses in these payments. Finally, um, just making sure that the way that everything is designed is with the recipients at the center um, and ensuring that their needs, barriers, and preferences are kept um, in mind uh, throughout the process. And for this, 
just having feedback loops uh, will be critical. If we go to the last slide, please. So as I was saying, the different parts of the bank came together uh, to publish this modern GDP architecture uh, uh, report that is available online on our website, and it uh, lays out this framework of the different design principles, uh, as well as the building blocks that must be taken into account. Uh, so you can check that online. Thank you very much. Thanks, Georgina. Thank you for that interesting perspective, uh, especially the different countries, how they benefited. With this, I invite CGAP, who is not only a partner of G2PX, but also of GIZ in this uh, G2P payments. Uh, over to you, Jeb. Yeah, thank you, uh, Anita. Uh, maybe if we could advance a slide, yeah. Um, it's a little difficult going uh, after um, Georgina on this one because you'll notice that my slide bears a striking resemblance to, to the slides that uh, Georgina put up. What I'm putting in front of you now is, is sort of how we've applied this in a country context, particularly in Indonesia, where we're part of a, a live, let's say, reform process. Um, agree, obviously, with everything that Georgina said, because, you know, a lot of those things we, we, we developed uh, jointly. Um, and I'll focus a little bit on G2P choice, which is we think is is, is very important. Um, if you look at the right side there, the the, the beneficiaries, um, you know, I would almost go so far as to say that you know to have a really truly recipient centric G2P system, uh, it needs to be an interoperable system. You, you can get you know part ways there with lots of bilateral agreements, but really, if you want a, a really a recipient centric system. Um, it needs to be interoperable. And, and that's what we've sought to, to, to pull together on this slide here. If you look at all those cogs there on the left, it's sort of represented there. Um, what this is really about is putting as much of the payment system at the disposal of the recipient as you possibly can. And, and we believe that if you give the beneficiary um, the choice of the provider so that they can choose you know, which provider suits them best, it does, may not sound like much, but it really unlocks some very, very powerful uh, positive benefits for the uh, for the recipient. And that's what we call GTP choice. Obviously, I think in, in Anita's initial slides, it showed the situation where uh, beneficiaries are really saddled with the provider that their particular program has signed up with. And obviously that often entails that um, they are settled with a provider that has maybe an ATM or a branch that's a few villages over. They're having to travel. It's not the one they would have chosen for themselves. And I think from research, we, we know that beneficiaries tend to choose the provider that has the cash out infrastructure that's closest to them. And we believe that central to that is, is putting as much of that payments infrastructure at their disposal. And actually, usually that means the kind of distribution uh, infrastructure there. So you'll see in, in my slide over here, that's you know the the full range of ATMs, agents, or even bank branches at their disposal, and there's some other elements to this. You know, I mean, um, obviously some sort of choice of the, the types of instruments that they might uh, be able to interact with. Um, all of that makes it makes an enormous difference uh, to the uh, to to the recipient. And you know, in in, in our financial inclusion world, we, we talk a, we talk a lot about well, we obviously talk a lot about financial inclusion, but I think central to this is that. If your GDP experience is poor, if you're having to, to travel two hours to access your benefit, any hope that a program might have of, of financial inclusion off the back of that is, is, is a forlorn hope. We believe as a as sort of a, as a basis, that experience of the GDP payment needs to be positive for you to have any shot at any sort of financial inclusion payoff uh, down the line. Um, I would also say that sort of if you look to, to the left, you see those two eagles, those represent sort of the programs. And you remember from Georgina's slide, uh, they were there as well. Um, we, we believe it's really important that programs don't set out to, to, to set up really bespoke payments infrastructure. Um, what If they can address the central payments architecture, um, it scales beautifully. So in a lot of the countries that we work with, you know, they might have upwards of 100 GTP type programs. Often, all of those programs will be doing something this bespoke. <laughs> Obviously, it scales much better if they can each address uh, the, the payment system, uh, the interoperable payment system. Um, and that, obviously, that scales much better. And that's really come into focus um, around COVID. And I would only say that this is only likely to increase. I mean, COVID showed just how central these types of systems are because they were called on to do so much more. Um, but this is only likely to to increase as as climate change starts starts to take hold. You're starting to see that these types of systems are front and center, right? 
um, as climate change adaptation uh, really you know comes comes to the fore is these types of systems which are going to be sure to be implicated as people are looking to adapt uh, to, to climate change but also as more and more people are going to be on the move as refugees it's these types of systems that will be interacting with them these systems will need to be scalable um, they'll need to be you'll need to be able to add new programs to them very quickly and it's these types of it'll be systems that look like this that'll be able to affect that so um, as relevant as this is now, it's only become more and more relevant. So these types of interoperable uh, GDP systems or architectures, if, if, if you will, will only become sort of more and more uh, relevant. So um, I think I'll, I'll leave it at that. I think I've taken my, my five minutes, but just to underline that uh, fully in support of everything I've, I've heard so far today. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much, Joop. Uh, so while uh, we also have Christine from CoDevelop joining us in this workshop, so before BMGF, I'll probably invite Christine for a quick perspective on this agenda of DCI and G2P payments. Christine, can you come in? Hi, Anita. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I can't put my, my video on this morning, but um, thankfully, I think most folks in this call know me, know CoDevelop. Uh, for, the, for those who don't, real briefly, CoDevelop is a new global fund that was set up uh, to support countries as they build their digital public infrastructure um, to make them equitable, um, to make them safe, and to make them diverse and inclusive. And so one of the ways in which we're um, supporting this along with our partners um, here on this call is to have a focus where there's been a spike of country demand on G2P payment systems. Um, as many folks have already mentioned, uh, this is largely due to the increasing instabilities that we've been seeing, um, economic, climate, um, pandemics, etc. And so we know that there is huge demand from countries to have support building their own systems and to build them well and build them scalable. And so um, we are very excited to be supporting uh, digital convergence. Um, many of you are also involved in a complementary um, uh, project, a complementary initiative called G2P Connect, which we see as, as folding in very nicely into the social protection programs that digital convergence is helping to to make um, scalable so very excited for all the work here and thank you so much let me know if you have any questions but otherwise i'll turn it back to anita yeah thanks christine now i'll invite uh, miller from bmgf to give his perspective what to you miller Miller, can you come in? Anita, I don't, uh, I think there might be some issue, but I don't see Miller in the participant list, so we can move on. Anita, you are on mute. Okay, so now I'll invite uh... Annapurna and Srivatsa to provide their perspective from India and the state of Karnataka. Over to you, Annapurna. Thank you, Anita. Uh, Srivatsa unfortunately could not join the call. He had some other urgent work come in. So I'd be taking uh, you through to my presentation on uh, Kutumba and uh, state ABT portal. Can we go to the first slide, please? Karnataka is uh, locate, one of the top five states of India, is located in southern part of India, has an estimated population of around 61 million, 61 million. and uh, it has been reported that around 13% are multidimensionally poor. 
41 departments of Karnataka provide welfare schemes or implement welfare schemes which provide either cash or kind benefits. And the mode of uh, delivery of this is uh, there are multiple IT systems which each of this uh, social project, these departments use, which transfer the cash benefits either through a state integrated financial management system, also known as Treasury or Kajane 2, or they're integrated directly with various banks. This mode of uh, transfer, have multi-mode of transfer, has results in few challenges to, with related, uh, related to the determination of the beneficiary identity, verifying how the what is the financial address, how do I do duplicate, and more importantly, from the perspective of the departments, how do I integrate with the banking system, which bank do I select for, as my uh, social protection bank, uh, because the beneficiary accounts are in multiple banks. So as a solution to this, the state DPT port portal has been developed, which is part of Kutumba, which is an integrated social protection system. Next slide, please. So as you see in this uh, image, uh, Kutumba contains uh, both various beneficiary management systems, which you can refer to as uh, social protection systems. All the systems are also connected to the payment portal, that is the state uh, direct benefit transfer portal, which uh, runs on Aadhaar, which is the unique identifier provided by unique uh, UIDAI of India. Next slide. So uh, we in Karnataka, uh, DBT project started in 2018 and in 2021 government uh, mandated that all beneficiary oriented payments must be routed through uh, DBT platform and Aadhaar would be the financial address. Now this has uh, helped the government in one as uh, we are now currently using Aadhaar as the financial address for all the payments. So when we use Aadhaar, there are certain guidelines which are specified by UIDI, where like Ms. Michael was talking about certain security measures which need to be adopted. So a state DBT portal extends a API service, which is a common API service, which are called by various departments. And a state DBT portal extends Aadhaar as a service to these departments. So all the departments have to do is now call this API at the time of seed, capturing the identity of the citizen. This helps them in um, not only carrying out beneficiary identification and deduplication, but it also enables the departments to store Aadhaar in data vault. This is one of the mandatory requirements of UIDI that uh, clear text Aadhaar needs to be stored in the vault and only a reference token needs to be stored. Expecting every department to have a data vault or building in those protocols to store Aadhaar is a very cumbersome process. This is simplified now by using a single global AUA. As a result of using this one AUA uh, for uh, Karnataka and extending this API as a common API, which is a very generic API, it has resulted in simplified processes. And uh, this API helps these departments or uh, social protection systems to push payments by calling this system. Now, uh, state DBT platform, as you can see in the architecture, is connected with various systems like National Payment Corporation of India, which uh, and it transfers the Aadhaar uh, details to NPCI to in turn to transfer the payment to the citizens or the beneficiary bank account. Now, we also extend a service where departments can use the reference tokens and check who, which are the citizens or others which have not been linked with bank accounts. So the citizens can be informed to link their bank accounts before pushing the, for the payment. And end-to-end -end tracking has now been made possible as and the message is sent to the beneficiary saying the payment has been credited to her account on so-and-so date. So far, uh, 200 plus schemes in the last one year, 2000, uh, last one year, 200 plus schemes have been onboarded. 100 million, 1 million plus transaction, which amounts to nearly 290,000 million rupees as payments has now been transferred to the state DBT platform. 
Uh, that's it from my side, Anita. Thanks, uh, Annapurna. Thank you for a very exciting and impressive statistics that you have shared for the 1800 schemes, a single DBT portal. We'll have quite a few questions, I hope, after uh, the couple of presentations from other people. So now I invite NPCI to share their perspective on this agenda. Over to you, Gaurish. Hi, uh, thank you, Anita, for the opportunity. Uh, we would like to thank uh, Digital Conversion in, uh, Convergence Initiative for the opportunity to present our use case uh, with DBT as a background. I hope I'm audible. Yes. OK, thank you. Uh, so j before I delve into that, uh, just a little bit about NPCI. Uh, next slide, yeah. Uh, so basically, NPCI was formed uh, under the aegis of RBI and the Indian Banking Associations to create uh, retail, to actually create uh, robust retail payment systems in India. Uh, it was uh, since its inception in 2008, we've basically created a host of products which have actually created a road ra uh, railroads for uh, digital payments in India. Uh, uh, Rupay is uh, India's answer basically to Visa and Master. Uh, that's our domestic payment scheme. Uh, there is IMPS, which is the immediate payment service. There's NACH. Uh, there is obviously UPI, which the world is aware about. We've also created uh, APS, NETC, and BBPS. NETC basically caters to the uh, to the travel segment. BBPS is our bill payment segment. Uh, so these these are the few products that uh, we've created over this over the past few years. Uh, the revolutionary product came in 2016, uh, wherein NPCI created uh, UPI, uh, which is uh, basically a, a set of standard APIs to facilitate online payments. Uh, UPI is open source, a uh, real time that facilitates interbank transactions. Uh, it's it's basically led to a revolution in digital adoption or digital payment adoptions in the country. Uh, as of uh, the number is a little dated. Uh, as of uh, as of last month. UPI processed around 7 billion transactions uh, and uh, with uh, any NIPL, which is our international uh, subsidiary, we are currently driving, uh, we are currently taking UPI international. Uh, there is work on already with UAE, Bhutan, Nepal, Singapore and France. Plus there are around 10 odd countries which we are talking to directly, uh, taking UPI international on the acceptance as well as on the issuance side. Uh, a little bit about DBT. Uh, so DBT has been uh, in, in action since, uh, uh, as, as per the en envisioned by the government of India since uh, Jan 2013. Uh, just, to, just to put some figures in perspective, uh, India has till date transferred around 25 trillion rupees uh, since 2015 in uh, through DBT. Uh, out of that, uh, around 11 odd trillion rupees have been transferred during the COVID pandemic in the last uh, in 2021 and 2022. Uh, and uh, we see this, uh, this growing further uh, with uh, adoption of uh, new use cases and new payment products that we have been developing. Uh, a little bit uh, today, obviously a large part of it was transferred using uh, IMPS, uh, using NACH and APS. Uh, these are the products that were used but what we have seen is uh, we have uh, Anita, we go to the next slide. Uh, what we have seen is uh, UPI railroads have actually driven uh, to the last mile, and uh, the transparency that UPI provides, uh, no other product of NPCI is currently providing. So we developed uh, eRupee as a digital payment solution with the help of NHA, the National Health Authority, uh, DFS, and uh, this was uh, basically a voucher without a card. Uh, without a digital payment app, and it can be widely used uh, only uh, with the via an SMS or a QR code as well. Uh, it was uh, it was envisioned uh, during uh, the COVID period to ensure that uh, the vaccination was provided to every citizen of India. So uh, we envisaged envisaged it as a use case for that. But now what we see is we we've opened it up to a whole lot of other use cases as well. Uh, next slide, Anita. So there are there are two parts to it. Uh, one is the creation parts. So uh, using the India stack, basically the government uh, 
has already has uh, the the complete details of the beneficiaries. Uh, these details uh, are basically provided by the government when they want to pass on the subsidy. They are provided to the banks with the various details. The banks in turn reaches out to NPCI, who using the UPI uh, UPI product creates e rupee as a voucher uh, for the for the beneficiary details shared, and those are in turn shared back to the bank or the government uh, government organization. This can also be used for corporates as well. Next slide. Uh, this the redemption process is pretty simple. We've uh, there's already a huge infrastructure in terms of acceptance which exists uh, for UPI. Uh, the redemption center is in already enabled for uh, wherever the redemption center may be. It's already enabled for EUP uh, from an acceptance standpoint. Uh, the acquirer will just have to scan the QR and the SMS string or whichever is provided uh, and in turn will send a, a verification code to the customer's mobile number. Uh, the verification code is then shared uh, by the beneficiary to the redemption staff or uh, at, uh, at the acceptance point. Uh, the acceptance point validates the voucher and the beneficiary uh, will uh, get the delivered, uh, get, will get the services or the goods delivered to him. Uh, this is uh, this uh, this may seem extremely simple, but uh, there is obviously uh, you know there is a lot of effort which has gone into it to uh, to ensure that there is no pilferage, uh, there is no uh, there is no duplication of the voucher. Uh, we've created uh, a completely secure system. Uh, this was widely used during COVID by corporates to use for their employees, by governments to provide. Uh, the voucher to the last mile so that uh, when when the government was charging uh, for the for the COVID vaccination at one point of time before it became free, this was widely used to provide the subsidy. Uh, Anita, next slide. Uh, the the new use cases that we see on EUP now, uh, which we are working with METI, with DFS, with uh, NHA, are uh, are as follows. We've we've already seen. A huge chunk of these being developed for rations. Uh, rations are basically your food subsidy that the government is providing to the tier three, tier four cities, and also to the tier five cities. Uh, there is already uh, a lot of subsidy that is provided on uh, LPG, which is a liquid petroleum gas, uh, in tier two, tier three, and tier four cities. Uh, this also moves to EUP going forward. Uh, fertilizer, uh, we actually ran. Uh, Two schemes uh, in in the state of Punjab and the state of Haryana, uh, wherein we ran this through prepaid cards. The government is to provide subsidies in in cards. Now these are also moving to EUP. Uh, there is obviously uh, the use case that on during COVID, medical uh, also has a huge use case on EUP. Subsequent slide, please. Uh, electric subsidies, electricity subsidies, uh, textile subsidies, uh, women and welfare, which is uh, we are working with uh, the women empowerment agencies in India to ensure that direct and transparent utilization of fund which are provided for the program uh, reach the end beneficiaries. And uh, this is one big chapter that we are working on. And uh, the last is obviously the vaccine, which we have already implemented. So that was uh, about uh, e rupee as a voucher and uh, how it will going forward become a large part of uh, the direct benefit transfers uh, that the government will. Thank you, Anita, for your time. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much, Gaurish. That was very impressive. Uh, and I think we'll have, I myself have a few questions, but I'll wait for the so, session on question and answer to follow up on this. So now I will invite uh, Mojulu Foundation to Paul Mekin to share his Thank perspective you. from, yeah. Thank you, Anissa. Can I actually share my slides? Because I had to make a few last minute changes for completeness. I, I think I did. I needed to... No, no, no. So yeah, are these the slides? No, uh, since no, then no, it changed again. Slides. Yes, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Can I please change? Thank yeah, you. Sure. I'll share mine. Okay, so I'm hoping that you can see my screen now. Can you? Yes. 
Thank you. OK, so sorry for that brief interruption. Uh, my name is Paul Makin. I'm the product manager for the Mojo Foundation. Um, effectively, our role is in uh, guiding and shepherding the Mojo community in the development of the uh, the Mojo Loop um, switch, for want of a better word. Um, I was asked to give a very brief uh, uh, introduction to the the Mojo Loop uh, uh, ecosystem and some of the deployments that we have out there. So to clarify, Mojo Loop is not uh, software for implementing a bank or a credit union or anything like that. It's the switch. It's all about clearing payments between these various institutions. It was developed from the ground up with inclusive payments in mind. It's all about connecting those institutions that uh, the, the established financial sector doesn't doesn't look at, by which I mean things like microfinance institutions, credit unions, etc., and bringing them into an inclusive interoperable payments ecosystem with all of those banks and mobile wallets also connected. The idea is that that reaches those people who only have an account with their local MFI, for example, or only have a mobile wallet, whatever it might be. It enables them to fully participate in the in the digital economy as it develops. Um, it has social payment support built in. And what do we mean by that? We mean that we can do um, uh, either um, mass payments, bulk payments, so we can take a payments list and and I'll say a thousand, two thousand, five thousand people, and execute that. And it doesn't matter where those people have their accounts. It could be in mobile wallets, in credit unions, in, in a bank, whatever it may be. The, the Mojo Loop switch will make sure that it gets to the right person. Um, as part of that, we have support for aliasing within the, the Mojo Loop ecosystem uh, within our Oracle. So we can, uh, we can uh, support routing to uh, a mobile phone number or any other alias. And as part of our recent work in in the uh, in the open source the DPG community, we are um, seeking to build on that to to integrate digital identities into our Oracle. And we're working very strongly um, around standardisation uh, for the interconnection between institutions and the wider ecosystem. This is the current state of play with regard to modular deployments and pilots. Um, probably to go round from the right hand side, we have Myanmar, where we've been working for a long time with uh, the module, with the MFI community in Myanmar to interconnect them into uh, the mobile wallets for to to uh, to reach out to more customers to make it more usable for for customers to allow allow greater choice and to help them to, um, to drive down on the necessary use of cash because since since the um, the uh, troubles they've been having in Myanmar because the lack of cash in the economy has really been an issue. Um, in Singapore we have a um, a pilot going on as a uh, using it as a remittance hub for remittances into the Philippines and to into Myanmar. Um, in Singapore again, we're working to integrate into the Nexus ecosystem, which is all about how do we link um, the the Mojo Loops type financial institutions, the MFIs, etc., into the conventional banking world, where the banks have all got together and developed their own way of interconnecting. So we want to be able to get into that as well. In Tanzania, we have the Tanzania uh, Instant Payment System Tips. Um, which was one of our earliest deployments, and that has has grown quite substantially over the last couple of years, and and is now live. You can do instant payments between the various institutions connected into TIPS, and there's a number of use cases that have been implemented. In South Africa, we have one that's currently um, gone off on their own. Really, they're developing their own um, payment service using Mojo Loop. And uh, we we wait to see what they'll do with it because there is no requirement that you work with the Mojo Loop Foundation. If they wish to, if they wish to go off and do their own deployment, their own implementation, then they're very welcome to. 
in Rwanda, we have the Rwanda National Payment System, which has been jogging along quietly in the background for quite some time now. It isn't actually live as yet using Mojaloop. Uh, we're working with the with the government there and with the, the major switch operator, our switch, on the deployment of uh, Mojaloop. Um, there's been a range of uh, political issues, you might say, which have delayed it, but it's coming along. And the important point from our perspective is we've built some very good um, uh, links into the into the uh, development community there. And of course, we have the Pan-African deployment of Mowali, which uh, was linking together wallets in, in different countries um, via, using Mojaloop, which has run into uh, regulatory problems. It's the switch is working perfectly, but the regulators really were not ready for this, I think. So that's the current state of play of deployments. Um, the Mojaloop ecosystem as a whole, um, I think it's fair to say that Mojaloop, we're now five years down the line since the original development of Mojaloop. Um, and I'd say it's now reaching maturity. We have live fully functional deployments, more are coming. I would say two, three years ago, you could possibly use it, but you'd have to work harder at it. Deployment now is becoming more of a a um, a routine uh, a routine event and much more simple. Systems integrators. Um, from the start, we've had um, the support of our, uh, the established international systems integrators, uh, Modusbox, who are present today, and Modusbox did did the bulk of the work in the development of Mojave in the early years. They've now rebranded themselves as Infitex. I might have spelled that wrongly. Um, we have other systems integrators we work with as well, Coil and Cybrin and others. Um, but as part of a, a relatively new initiative, we, we've started to build communities of local SIs. And this strategy has, been, has started to uh, become successful. Uh, we've got three in Rwanda, and we've got multiple that we work with in Singapore and Myanmar, and they're showing early promise. And we're actually starting to see the SIs in Singapore working directly with the SIs in Myanmar, which is a, a, a hugely positive step forward from our perspective. And we're also supporting multiple fintechs, uh, financial technology companies who want to um, develop apps for, for, um, for example, for an, uh, an ambitious um, MFI or for um, on their on their own under their own auspices. They think there's potential for innovation, and they can use a merger loop, the merger loop hub that's deployed in their country to reach out to new customers. Community building, well. A good example of that is uh, WinePay, which arose out of the MFI sector. We brought people across the community together to identify a common need. And out of that, we developed a scheme council, we developed scheme rules, and we developed a, a module of deployment as the embodiment of those scheme rules. We've been taking a similar approach in Rwanda, and that, that community outreach activity we undertook gave rise to these uh, three systems integrators joining the community. And at our recent community meeting last week in Rwanda, we saw the first fruits of the work of those uh, independent systems integrators, which was heartening to see. Um, on payment standardization, uh, Mojo Loop is collaborating with the International Standards Organization and their various subcommittees to standardize instant payment protocols for financial inclusion. And Michael Richards, who spoke earlier, is leading all of that work. Um, we're also working with Nexus to integrate the world of financial inclusion with mainstream financial services. And we also are collaborating with Visa on international services. So as you can see, there's an awful lot of work going on in the Mojo space at the moment. Um, uh, our work with, um, with, with Visa, with Nexus, and we've recently been talking with Ant in China, um, altogether, we're starting to establish Mojoop as a significant player in the in the payment space generally, but our focus on financial inclusion, I think, sets us apart. And I think that's everything from me, and I'd like to thank you for your time. Over back to you, Anita. Thanks, Paul. Thanks so much for sharing the journey of Mojoop. Uh, 
so far. It's interesting to hear and probably we'll have some side conversations later on how you build your community, which will be super interesting for other digital public goods and initiatives. And with this, I now invite Swiss TPH, which is implementing uh, payment system in Tanzania, where I, we heard that Mojo Loop has its tips instance. Over to you, Dragos. Thank you, Anita. Before I start, just mention we don't use Mojaloop in Tanzania, but it's one of the cases we do integrate with payment switch in Tanzania. So I'm Dragos Dobre, IT system architect at Swiss Tropical Public Health Institute, leading the maintenance and support uh, projects of, for the open source insurance management information system, open IMIS platform, and also led different uh, development projects where payment layer actually was developed and integrated within open image. So before I start with actual uh, technical uh, uh, inside with the open image, how it was implemented and developed uh, this payment uh, integrated probability layer, I will start first with a concept. So why that? Because uh, when we build, when we develop open image product, we try to be as generic as possible in order to allow the management of multiple social protection and health insurance schemes uh, through business modules. All these business, business modules are communicating between them within services and seniors because we did a modular uh, and micro kernel architecture. Uh, so every implementation could combine and use uh, business modules they want to use. Uh, so insurance, man insurance management, claim management, reportings. Uh, and for the integration with Accenture system, we try to be as generic as possible and use uh, existing standards. So this is why we have standard APIs and we did implement this fire interoperability layer, which allow us to connect to different uh, health system through fire standard. Uh, we also wanted to do this integration with payment switches through standard APIs as like fire, even if fire is more for health and less used for the payment uh, integration. Uh, but from our experience, uh, we know that every country, uh, every context has their own and specific payment switch, uh, which doesn't match it or doesn't have an API, uh, which is standardized like FIRE. So they have, have their own API, the custom APIs. And to some extent, you need we need to go, uh, connect through the uh, to those APIs through custom APIs. Uh, one possibility will also be to be, have an adapter through the standard APIs, uh, and then here is the decision of the context country specific partners to, if they want to pa pass by the, this interoperability layer adapter, or they really want to have the like, custom APIs between open limits and the specific switches, which is a, the case actually in Tanzania. Uh, so now next slide will go more into details about uh, the generic architecture of our payment layer. So as I mentioned, uh, it's a micro kernel architecture composed with different uh, business modules. Uh, maybe you can see here the resemblance what Michael presented in the beginning, but on the other direction uh, from bottom to up to the actual payment switches. Um, so for us, what we are interested in, so we don't have an external API, uh, what it was presented by Michael for the payment management when this payment layer, which is in the middle, it's actually our generic management of the payments, if it's income payments or uh, traffic to be paid, so invoices and bills uh, uh, type of payments. So what we did actually is to create these generic services and seniors in order to that to the business models to allow the transformation and the request of different payments. So what you see in the orange in the bottom size, and then we also wanted to make sure we can connect to the external seas as generic as possible if with a fire module. So on the right uh, and for the specific payment switches that don't allow us to connect with a generic uh, standardized ways, then to have additional payment uh, adapters modules specific for the payment switch. So if you connect to different payment switches, the specific payment switches, you will have to have one adapter per payment switch with a specific custom API. So this is a generic architecture what we developed into OpenIMIS and to go more into 
specificities for Tanzania. Next slide. So here is exactly what we aim to do in Tanzania. So it's not yet finished, so it's a work in progress. We work on the MUSE integration, so we have two payment systems. So you have the government e-payment gateway, GPG, which allow us to uh, gather the contributions from the insurers uh, for the policies during enrollment. So it's about mobile or bank uh, payments. And MUSE, it's an accounting system which allows the payment to the uh, health facility for claim reimbursement, but also for the fees for enrollment officers uh, that they will gather through enrollments. So we have in the bottom all the business model we are using. So we are using the for the modules for the enrollment part, and we are using modules for the uh, claim review and process part. Uh, what we are interested here actually is about the different calculation rules. The calculation rule for us is a mechanism for transformation and requesting a payment to be done or to be received. Uh, and also in order to connect to the specific uh, payment switch. So here the old, which is uh, clients so of mo mobile money, banks uh, and health facility account are external to this diagram. They are not displayed here, but we are doing this uh, MUSE payment adapter, MUSE GPG payment adapter in order to communicate with a specific APIs, which are uh, custom to those payment switches in order to communicate. One additional uh, information here is each of the payment switch, they have their own uh, process of managing payments. For example, with the government e payment gateway, uh, it's working based on a control, control number and there are different steps in order to request control number, uh, receive the confirmation, have the uh, reconciliation. So this process is also managed by these ad payment adapters and are outside of the payment layer, which remains as generic as possible. It doesn't have to change. So if somebody wants to integrate with an external payment system within open implementation, they will have only to define what payment for which business modules processes they want to implement and with, with which payment uh, switches they will want to connect to. Either they are standardized and they could connect through FIRE standard, uh, or they will be specific custom payment switches where they will have to develop this payment adapter to match with the API or with the language, but also with the processes which are which is managed by those uh, by that uh, payment switch. And with that, uh, this is how we implement in OpenIMIS. Thank you, Anita. Back to you. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, it's so interesting to see how a specific country implementation is happening with multiple gateways. Uh, this was super helpful and useful as we build our standards. And now we bring come to the last uh, lightning presentation from Microsoft Consulting. So over to you, Mithun. Thank you, Anita. So I'll be talking about some of the principles to, to build an open and interoperable <coughs> public, digital public infrastructure. And after that, I'll give you an example uh, from India. So we believe that to build an inter interoperable and open uh, in public infrastructure, uh, ecosystem approach is, is needed. And when you talk about ecosystem approach, there are three key considerations that we think are important. So first is the law policy and regulation. And of course, all three of them are different but I've clubbed them in just, just one bucket. Second is architecture and design and economics and funding. Uh, now we talk about law policy and regulation. So it's a, it's a, it's a question that everyone keeps, uh, keeps battling with, whether the law and the regulation should come first or the innovation should come first. And I don't think there's any clear answer uh, to that. But of course, a broad policy framework helps if you want to create an open interoperable uh, infrastructure, which has to work at scale. And this broad policy uh, uh, should, uh, or rather it, it governs the design and architecture of the system, right? Because it's very difficult and expensive to fix the design and the architecture, which has to work at scale and with ecosystem if the initial design choices uh, are, are not correct. And the last one is economics and funding. This is 
uh, of course, most critical. So how if so creating something is easy, but sustaining it is difficult. So how it's going to be funded year after year, whether the public finance resources will be committed, whether this infrastructure will generate its own funding and how it will generate and so on and so forth. Of course, in our experience across the globe, it's important to have some seed funding initially from the government for, for a definite for a finite uh, point of time before such infrastructure can start generating its own money. Now, these three things are not in any order of priority. So as I was saying, the jury is out, which should come first, whether you should design and architect a, a system and then law policy and regulation follow it. Of course, some building uh, basic uh, uh, things are, are important to, to start off. Uh, now moving to the next slide where I will be taking you through one of the examples from India. So India, as you know, a lot has been already been said by uh, Karnataka and by uh, NPCI on how these various components are working in India's social protection example. So I take I'm taking example for India because this is uh, one of the largest social protection ID and, and payment system which is working at scale for for multiple years. Uh, there are others as well, uh, but I thought this will give us some sense of uh, the complexity as well as as I'll be able to present some numbers here. So I've broken down this whole infrastructure and this is uh, an oversimplified view in three broad components. So one is en enrollment infrastructure. So enrollment infrastructure is completely federated, which is governed by various government ministries, departments and states. So Karnataka government presented uh, recently uh, just before this and uh, every state can create their own, own uh, registries for enrolling beneficiaries. Every department within government can create their, and that's how it is created. And if we move to the next one, then there is the payment infrastructure or the backend payment infrastructure, right, which is a transfer infrastructure. Now with all these registries integrate with something that we call as public finance management system, which is a government created uh, payment layer, we can say. And then the NPCI infrastructure for the Aadhaar payment bridge, which, uh, which which orchestrates this payment and sends it to various various banks. And if you move to the last part, which is a withdrawal infrastructure. So once the money has reached various banks, bank accounts of people, and there are various types of banks which operate in India, then also there are choice of people to withdraw this. So of course there are traditional uh, ATM channels. If you can continue clicking, Anita, I'm sorry for the animation. So there are traditional ATMs and then there is a new innovation which uh, I spoke about is APS, Aadhaar Enable Payment System. So digital ID can be used at the front end of the last mile to withdraw money apart from the traditional bank. Then there are Bhim Aadhaar Pay and UPI. Now the common theme across all these three layers is the use of digital ID. So digital ID is one which is unifying. So in the enrollment infrastructure, digital ID is key for enrolling uh, people across databases and registries. In the transfer infrastructure, Aadhaar payment bridge, which again uses digital ID to orchestrate the payments across various bank banks. And then at the time of withdrawal, uh, especially for G2P recipients, A, because they find using ATM a little difficult, Aadhaar enabled payment system is key, which is again based on, based on Aadhaar. So now talking about some of the benefits, if you can click on the next slide, because uh, uh, before that, so this infrastructure is also used not just for uh, cash payments, it's also used for in-kind payments, right? And it, it covers about 900 million uh, people. So it is population about 1.4 billion. So now a lot, uh, the questions are always asked about the cost benefit. So I thought these numbers will, will uh, provide some perspective to people. So I, Try to pull together the numbers, uh, the amount of investment that government has put into building this digital ID ecosystem, which is $1.8 billion till 2021. Uh, now, if you look at other investments in building other registries and all, so there is no uh, clear indication of numbers, but we can say it will be in the range of uh, $2, 3000000000 billion or something. But if you look at the benefits, so far, $350 billion have flown through this system and I'm talking about the G2P money and I'm talking about just the money which the federal government has transferred through the ecosystem and the state governments have also transferred almost similar amount. So we're talking about money in the range of $600 billion which have flown through the system over the last seven years or so. Uh, talking about some of the direct benefits and indirect benefits, societal benefits are huge, but I'm just talking about direct benefits. So government uh, of India itself estimates a, uh, a saving of $30 billion and this is very basic saving just by removing fake duplicate people 
from the social protection databases because everything was integrated through a, through a common uh, digital ID. The interesting thing is the service providers, which includes financial service providers, telecom operators and others, their savings are in the range of $44 billion. And this I'm talking in terms of reduced cost of KYC. Now, the cost of KYC reduces, which enable these service providers to serve poor people, people from low and middle income background, because the KYC cost dropped from close to $5 to close to 10 cents. And that's why it enables people, these institutions to serve more and more people, which serve the G2P costs, because the opening account was, is key to uh, having, uh, to, to transferring uh, G2P. And uh, the proof of the pudding was during uh, COVID. And this was a stress testing of the system when the COVID lockdown was announced. Uh, 400 million accounts received almost instant cash transfer. The scheme was announced by the government. Within a week, people received money into the bank accounts. And then various people were skeptical whether it will work out or it will not work out. Various independent surveys show that most of the people received this money almost instantly and they were able to use it. So, so benefits far outweigh if we if we think about building an ecosystem with which is open and interoperable, the benefits uh, will definitely outweigh the cost. The only thing that is needed is a long term thinking and an ecosystem approach. Uh, I'll stop here and back to you, Anita. Thanks, Mithil. That is super, super impressive and a good pitch for how identification and digital payments are so vital for G2P payments. And with this, we are at the end of our presentations. We Now the floor is open for Q&A. Any questions people can put in the chat or raise their hands. Questions, comments, reactions, all are welcome. I mean, even the speakers can ask questions to the other team members. Yes, Komal, can you can come in? Thanks, Anita. I actually uh, would like to get some insights from Annapurna as during her implementation on Kutumba. What are the key enablers and challenges they come across? Uh, see, uh, the key enabler for us has been uh, the Aadhaar infrastructure, which has been set up uh, in India. So. Uh, all, the coverage of Aadhaar now is almost 99%. It has been saturated. Citizens are aware of using Aadhaar and uh, they are willing to provide Aadhaar and uh, uh, get the benefits through that. Having said that, the challenges continue. There are some challenges. One is that uh, citizens uh, need to know which account of theirs the Aadhaar is linked to particularly because uh, a citizen uh, has uh, more than one bank account and uh, they may end up linking it to some other account which is uh, at a far off distance. The banking correspondence and the post office correspondence who were postmen who work as banking correspondents has reduced this uh, to a greater extent. But uh, linking of accounts uh, to the Aadhaar has been a challenge because we did find when we initially started, we started with the pre-metric scholarship to uh, children being transferred through Aadhaar. So nearly in the first year, we had about uh, 50 lakh plus children, that is about 5 million school children being paid uh, through this mechanism. A big challenge we faced was linking of Aadhaar to the bank accounts. Then we had to pull in, uh, get the uh, banking uh, system to collaborate with us and uh, get this uh, implemented. As of now, uh, the second challenge was creating awareness amongst the departments on the usage of Aadhaar and benefits of using 
uh, your Aadhaar as a service and using the state DBT platform. Now that government has mandated that beneficiaries payments have to be routed through DBT platform, it has become easier and departments uh, know the system and they onboard themselves onto this DBT platform to go further. I hope I've answered your question, Komal. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing your experience. Thank you. Do we have other questions? Yes, come in. Amit. Yes, hi everyone. I'm Amit. I'm um, speaking on behalf of a program um, UNCDF is running in Fiji. Um, here we have a kind of a micro use case scenario working with the, the Department of Social Welfare uh, to see how best uh, the the humanitarian payments that go after uh, uh, a natural disaster event. So there the major issue is a we, the, the country doesn't have the type of infrastructure that you know some of the examples presented today showed. That's also why I was asking what are the requirements for these type of systems to be used. But their particular scenario is the Department of Social Welfare is finding particularly hard to uh, not just enroll people, but to maintain that registry, how to maintain um, a registry with people that are a, alive, still alive, and be the number, the details are accurate and complete. From a payment side, it is ra relatively easier than to work with the registry, um, whether through you know through any type of a BIMS connection or otherwise independent through a pre-process listing. However, my question, this why I'm mentioning this, and my specific question is: Are there examples of uh, deploying um, whether direct or interoperable payment side work through social protection programs where there are issues with the um, beneficiary registries, or if there are some some suggestions around um, how do we work with the governments where we do have problem in the beneficiary registry. Thank you. I'm not sure if uh, Annapurna or NPCI somebody would like to address this answer. This is more less on payment layer, but it is more on the social protection system side. And anybody would like to react? Yeah, this is Mithul. So uh, I'll not say it's an answer, but it's just a just a perspective on on this. So uh, for social protection payments, of course, um, identification is the key, right? And uh, uh, whatever and you are right, uh, Amit. Whatever examples presented today they are for large scale because the car cost will not be reducing significantly if you have to implement it in a low population country so the identification systems have to be a little different but you said that identification is a challenge in that case a fully digital system may not work so what we have seen in in many countries even in large countries when the digital systems were not there there were various community proofing ways. How can you empower communities to identify beneficiaries during such disaster and, and then create various mechanisms to, to, uh, to, to assign accountability to them? So I think what would work in such a context is going to be a mix of digital and physical system. So the so design choices have to be very, very different for such countries. So I just want to share this 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 input. I'm there's not an answer, as I said. This is just some some perspective. Thanks so much, Mithil. I see Annapurna also wants to come in. Go ahead, Annapurna. Yeah, uh, I would like to give you an input on how uh, we are handling this issue in Karnataka. In Karnataka, we have linked the civil registry, birth and death system, to our social protection system. So uh, uh, the civil registry is capturing the either Aadhaar or the Kutumba ID at the time of registration of death. The, death, the data flows into Kutumba and we 
published broadcast this disease data to various social protection uh, IT systems or uh, beneficiary management systems so that they can identify if the applicant or in case of it's a recurring benefit they can uh, verify whether the particular beneficiary is still alive or not there is a component uh, they may carry out a field verification or uh, they may uh, cancel it at their end using the data provided by kutumba thanks so much annapurna that's very helpful amit uh, does that address at least part of your Okay, thank you. So I think we are reaching the end of the session, but I can probably give time for one quick question if anybody would like to ask. Yes, Rajdeep, go ahead. Hi, uh, my question is for uh, Mozalup team. So uh, who are the system integrators and uh, who supports Mozalup? Who are the systems? Sorry, this, well. <coughs> Sorry, Michael. Carry ahead. on, Bob. No, no, I've, yeah, no. I defer to you well, as uh, Mr. Mojali. Michael represents is probably our, our major system integrator. They've done a huge amount of work. Um, they were the um, the principal systems integrator on the uh, wine pay deployment in Myanmar, for example. And they've done a great deal of work in Rwanda and elsewhere. Um, the new round of small inter systems integrators we are just we we have three in rwanda and a couple in in myanmar i'm not precisely sure if it's if it's two or three in myanmar we've just got them through the training phase and uh, uh they're now uh they're now being given their own uh mini tasks if you if you like to do their own contribution to the mojo loop uh the mojo loop um product and they're they're coming along well uh, I can't tell you the names of the companies off the top of my head. Uh, I'm not very good at that kind of thing. I apologize. But if you want to drop me an email, then I can certainly make introductions if that would help. Thanks so much, Paul. So, Napuna, I don't know if that's a old hand or you wanted to come in. Uh, no, it's a old hand. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you all for all your uh, presentations, inputs. And with this, probably I'll just invite Veronica to do the wrap up. Veronica, over to you. I'll share the slides. Yes, thanks a lot, Anita. Um, first of all, thank you so much uh, to all of you um, for the incredibly rich presentations and discussions. I won't even try to summarize everything uh, we've heard about today. I think uh, really starting from the overall technical framing and rationale for um, um, improving payment interfaces uh, to very concrete country examples, to different challenges, to the cost benefit analysis. We, we really um, have heard from so many different experiences and perspectives. Um, this was uh, incredibly uh, useful, I think, um, and I hope everybody enjoyed this as much as I did. Um, can you switch to the next slide, please? So instead of uh, summarizing what we've heard, I think um, it's worth maybe for this group of people who joined uh, the conversation, it's interesting to look at the way forward and next steps of how what can we do together and how, how can we move forward from here. Um, as Ralph uh, presented in at the beginning of the session, uh, this uh, was uh, one of three workshops on interoperability in action, looking really at three very um, concrete um, use cases um, for the um, starting with uh, um, CRVS systems, which we saw in the last workshop, payment systems for this workshop, and the next one um, on national identification systems, um, which probably will uh, take place sometime in December. So we will communicate that date and uh, please watch out and make sure you join again. Um, in the second work stream on standard settings, we have working groups for each of these uh, uh, three use cases, the CRVS, the payment and the national ID, um, for which we look into the processes Data, uh, process data and APIs I standards and developing these standards and uh, um, 
uh, and there is opportunities to 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 join those working groups um, and and we we look forward uh, if there's any interest to support this work um, and then um, thirdly a reflection on a further or additional interoperability uh, interfaces and here we are thinking um, of uh, interfaces with uh, social registry, uh, social registries with um, social protection management information systems, social registries with pharma registries, as well as with disability registries. Um, if we can move to the next slide. So as I said, uh, we welcome any support that you may want to give to the initiative um, in the process of, of building community of practice, consensus building, harmonization of standards, um, so really making sure we all uh, talk and use the same language, spreading awareness about the Digital Convergence Initiative and promote, promoting the adoption of standards and other outputs. Um, and of course, adopting the standard and using it yourself uh, to the extent that they are relevant for your work on social protection projects. And if you do so, share feedback and, and help us um, move forward and, and improve uh, further jointly. Um, as I said, there are these three working groups for the uh, three concrete um, use cases, uh, but th that uh, we, we welcome any uh, participation in. You can, um, at a very low level, just share existing materials and, and, and stay informed on our work. Um, you're also very welcome to, to review outputs and, and, and get more engaged by joining group discussions, uh, joining our workshops, or even uh, heavily getting into the nitty gritty details of drafting standards and guidelines um, alongside the facilitators of, of the, the groups. Um, so with this, we've come uh, to an end of, uh, of the workshop. You can, there are also varial, of co various, of course, digital means <laughs> with which you can connect with the Convergence Initiative through our website, through our uh, area on, on discourse, uh, through Twitter, um, etc. So you, you find them on this slide. And uh, yeah, with that, thanks again um, to, to everyone for joining, uh, for sharing your experience, for discussion, for, uh, discussing and raising interesting questions. Thanks, Veronica. Thank you so much. And thanks to all the participants, presenters, everything. We are closing on dot. Uh, look forward to your participation, participation in the next lecture. <laughs>